My presentation is on the cheapest atom bomb, the East German uprising of 1953, deconstructing socialism, and the broken promises of rollback. Now, of course, the first question is, why should you care about the East German uprising of 1953? Well, I think the East German uprising of 1953 is an important case study in the U.S. promoting its democratic values, promoting freedom and self-determination around the world, and then when it actually got what it wanted, a pro-democracy movement in a country it was targeting with propaganda, then the U.S. response was nowhere to be found. And the people of East Germany, even though they followed through almost word for word on the lines of U.S. rhetoric that had been prominent for years, the U.S. made no effort to get involved in East Germany or to help the people achieve their democratic aims. Um, the first point I'd like to go over is just the actors in the East German uprising. The first is, of course, the United States, uh, led by President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who had just been elected a year previously. Um, the, the U.S. at this point is just gearing up its propaganda um, apparatus, and Eisenhower is, of course, very interested in using this and will become a staple of his foreign policy for the next eight years. But at this point, Eisenhower is trying to fulfill a promise he made in the campaign called rollback rather than just the containment of Cannon and Truman that you heard about just now. Um, instead, Eisenhower is promising the American people and the world at large that the U.S. is going to push communism out of areas where it's already made progress. Not only is the U.S. going to keep communism inside a, a tightly concealed area, it's going to actually remove communism from areas and install democratic regimes in those places. The next actor is, of course, the Soviet Union. At this point in 1953, uh, Stalin had just died. It's led by a troika of Malenkov, Beria, and Molotov, and they're pursuing what the U.S. calls a peace offensive. Now, of course, these are sort of contradictory terms, peace and offensive, but essentially the Soviet Union's attempting to be reasonable, to acquiesce to Western demands, to not push too hard, and in 1953, right before Stalin died, he wrote what was called the Stalin Note, essentially saying, we'll let Germany be reunified, we'll let East join with West as long as there's no threat that Germany will invade us a third time in 30 years. Um, and so that the Soviet Union is attempting to appear reasonable and pursuing that as their foreign policy. And at the same time, they were initially undergoing a Sovietization process in East Germany, led at this point by Walter Ulbricht. And East Germany is attempting to Sovietize to become a bona fide socialist country, but they're noticing more and more problems with that process as refugees are fleeing East Germany and as the government itself is noticing a lack of efficacy in the policies that it hoped to inspire, limited strikes throughout the country. Um, so they're rethinking that Sovietization process. And lastly is West Germany, led by Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. The West German Republic is um, cozying up to the West under Adenauer, and in fact, in national security documents from this time, the president um, was recorded as saying, sorry, let me just pull up the quote, um, quote, the president said that he would do almost anything to help the German chancellor, end quote. And this relationship is borne out by working together on different CIA missions, on Eisenhower using his propaganda apparatus against um, Adenauer's uh, opponent party, the SPD, and it will play a prominent role in the East German uprising as to how they deal with that conflict and what their priorities are rather than the East German people. So the first step was uh, Eisenhower producing his propaganda apparatus. And the, some examples are Western technical journals, which were distributed to counter-communist propaganda journals. Um, another was monthly magazines published out of Frankfurt, which were designed as a means of keeping alive the spark of democratic tradition. But the most important in West Berlin was the Rios broadcast. Uh, Rios is a radio station that operated out of West Berlin, and from there they produced all sorts of U.S. propaganda. They had a mixed staff of U.S. and German employees, but the U.S. bragged in its national security documents that uh, Rios was, quote, accepted by many of its German listeners as a bona fide German station, end quote. Of course, the U.S. wouldn't be so elated and surprised that it was accepted if it was a bona fide German station, and this, of course, reveals that it was likely one of the tools Eisenhower was using to spread the U.S. message. The um, first steps of the uprising began when East Germany, the GDR, pursued the new course, 
essentially ending the Sovietization process and rolling back their progress on creating a socialist republic. Instead of moving forward on that, they were going to lessen taxation, lessen other burdens, um, and try to mild their turn their stance into a more milder one. Um, unfortunately, this left in place work norms. Essentially, these work norms were part of the Sovietization process, saying that people had to work more hours, but they didn't give them any additional pay with those hours. And these work norms would provide the catalyst for the uprising. Even though all the other Sovietization moves had been uh, repealed, this being left in place would continue um, to cause problems for them. And the uprising begins on June 16th with marching uh, mostly by construction workers. And it continues down through the streets of Berlin to government offices, initially protesting these work norms, saying that we're not getting enough pay, we're being slaves to the system, um, things like this. But the chance of the protesters and their purpose for marching quickly change. And instead what we see is quotes like this, we want to be free, our demonstration is not against norms. And you quickly see the uprising changing from demonstrating against norms to demonstrating in favor of democratic change, in favor of freedom, liberal democracy, self-determination. Um, and later that evening, the SED, the Communist Party of East Germany, will revoke those work norms and will acquiesce, basically, to the protesters' demands, but that doesn't stop the uprising from continuing. The next day, on uh, June 17th, the uprising continues, led by Rios broadcasts. Rios is broadcasting all through the night about the uprising and the protests the previous day, and Rios will aspire to um, refer to, quote, references to the great traditions of 1848, end quote. And the CIA is essentially saying here that they're reminding the German people of democratic uprisings in the 1840s, reminding them of those great traditions, and thereby encouraging more democratic protests in uh, the subsequent day. 20,000 to 50,000 workers go on strike in, on June 17. Uh, eventually, the Soviet Union, around mid-afternoon on June 17, sends in tanks led by Leverenti Beria, um, who is part of that troika in the Soviet Union. And those tanks are used to initially suppress the uprisings, but eventually the most effective method they find of putting it down is rounding up the leaders during the night. Not when they're in big groups that are hard to disperse or isolate, but rather when they go home in the evenings, rounding them up, and eventually 1,400 people are given life imprisonment sentences. Um, Adenauer's foreign minister, however, Herbert Blankenhorn, um, goes to the British and tells them that his major concern, however, is, quote, he is worried about election prospects, end quote. Of course, Adenauer's election would be coming up in about three months' time, and this is the primary concern for the U.S. and West Germany when they see these events in the East. Um, these are probably best typified by a special assistant to the president, C.D. Jackson, who's um, an eccentric character but a close friend of Eisenhower and tends to put things rather bluntly. Oh, this is now a wonderful opportunity. We'll just exploit this to the full. Um, not only would C.D. Jackson say that, but he would also go on to describe the uprising, saying there could be a terrible letdown in the East and West Germany, which would seriously affect Adenauer's position if the U.S. did not make some sort of hay out of the uprising and find a political use for it. So the political use they find is a food aid program. Now, this program would be distributed from West Berlin, but provided to East German citizens. And the food aid program would essentially encourage East Germans to come from all throughout the greater Berlin area and come into West Berlin where they would be exposed to sort of how the West Berlin side isn't engulfed in flames and riots at this point in time. They would get to hear the stories of West Berliners, get to experience the propaganda, and also get to receive a care package that was courtesy of the West German and U.S. governments. Um, eventually, five and a half million food parcels were distributed, and it's estimated that 75% of East Berliners were able to receive food from this project. Not only that, but the U.S. managed to attract East Germans from the outer peripheries of the greater area that may not have been susceptible to other forms of propaganda or broadcast. Now, um, C.D. Jackson, the special assistant to the president, would describe this program saying, 
If Adenauer wins a resounding victory, it will have been due in large part to the food program. And this was because they were attempting to help Adenauer appear um, more sympathetic to the East German plight, and that that would sell well with the West German audience that he was trying to appease. Uh, Adenauer had historically opposed the reunification of Germany's just because he didn't trust the communist government in the East Germany. But the SPD government he was running against was encouraging dealing with the Soviet Union, reunifying, and only by um, making Adenauer seem sympathetic to the East Germans while simultaneously making the communist regime seem impossible to deal with could they improve Adenauer's election chances. Um, High Commissioner for Germany, James Conant, would describe the food aid program, saying, we don't want to do anything that will cause any more bloodshed. Keep the pot simmering, but not bringing to a boil. And this goes back to wanting to use this to cause mayhem in the Soviet bloc without actually creating a democratic revolution, without going all the way and actually creating a democratic government in East Germany. The aftermath of this would include um, demonstrating to Eisenhower the efficacy of propaganda. Eisenhower would find this a valuable tool throughout the rest of his foreign policy and would become a, a hallmark that he would keep with him all eight years. Um, also, Adenauer was elected in a, a huge sweep in the September elections and um, would come to have another term as, prime, as chancellor and prime minister. Um, Beria, who sent in the tanks from the Soviet Union, was convicted in a show trial and removed from power. Um, it was blamed in large part on his handling, his brutal handling, of the East German uprising, but it would remove him from power and pave the way for Khrushchev to uh, take over in the Soviet Union. Um, the US also would find it easier to build a coalition uh, for four power talks. They found West Western Europe had sort of become susceptible to the peace offensive, they called it. They viewed the Soviet Union as reasonable, but by using this to show that the Soviet Union was willing to use brutality, they found Churchill and France more easy to work with and more willing to work against the Soviet Union. But lastly, the pessimism um, that consumed East Germany would largely define the rest of the regime. Uh, now the, the activists that had sort of initiated the pro-democracy protests um, fell into a sort of apathy. Many of their numbers were gone, but those that were left found it harder and harder to justify staying around. Um, and one quote from a protester of that period, I think, makes clear um, exactly the issue. We can't strike. No one supported us on June 17th. And with that, the hopes that the East Germans had for uh, moving forward to democracy were quashed. Thank you for listening. It's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much.